Cool. Um, you first? First. Okay. Sure, Great. So. so good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Neil Kamen. I am the manager of the Monitoring Assessment Planning Program for Watershed Management Division at DEC here, Environmental Conservation. So hi to folks on the phone, uh, or at least on the Skype line, and those who came in, I expect other people to be trickling in. People are probably looking for parking spots, which are always at a severe premium at our office here. Um, I want to recognize Tina Bosch Ladd from Limnotech and also, um, sorry, no, not from Limnotech, sorry, from here at Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. We'd love to have her. Um, yeah, she's <laughs> really our sponsor for this work along with Nature Conservancy, who will get up and have a few words, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Limnotech, our consultants for this work. Cree Linalak is in the room as well. And so um, I just wanted to make a couple quick remarks that this is a really exciting uh, time for water quality in Vermont. We're in a place now where we've passed foundational new laws, the Vermont Clean Water Act and Act 64, which is going to enable us as a community both regulators like us here in DEC, watershed partners and regional planning commissions like folks that are at this table right now, and others to make substantial forward progress in water quality in Vermont. And one of the things we need to do that is a robust, precise, and geographically explicit system so that we can know where to go to put money at the highest priority locations to achieve the best benefit first. And that's what the Clean Water Roadmap is going to help us with. So I manage the tactical basin planning process, and it's basically the process that translates what we know about the landscape into where we should spend money. So Carrie Dolan from the Ecosystem Restoration Clean Water Initiative Program is in charge of the money, but I'm in charge of the where, um, which is just slightly frightening uh, position to be in. But tools like this give me some comfort because these information technology modeling tools, which we're going to learn about this morning, publicly available, provide for transparency as to why the state is proposing to put funds in one location or another, to put regulatory mechanisms in one location or another. And as I hope you'll find out as you watch the, sh the show and the rollout, for lack of a better word, that these are tremendously powerful modeling tools. Now, they're still modeling, and we need to go verify. We need to put eyeballs on the ground and boots on the ground to verify that what the model suggests is actually true before we invest. However, being that it's a fairly, even a small state, it's still a big land area. There's not that many boots and eyeballs. So these are the types of tools we need to know where to go and look first. So, so I thank you for being here. I'm really excited. Uh, later on during our presentation, I'll show an example of um, one area that I've been using the Clean Water Roadmap just to kind of play some what-if scenarios and intersect the opportunities for conservation and water, water retention, water conservation through the um, through the blueprint with phosphorus reduction through the Clean Water Roadmap. And then at the end, uh, if there's time, I might show you some other tools that DEC has been working on as well to provide specificity on the actual projects. So with that, I will turn it over to you, my good man. All right. And thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Rutter. I'm here representing Luminotech along with uh, Derek Schley. We'll be kind of tag teaming a little bit on the, uh, the demonstration this morning. Um, so uh, just a quick note, Limnotex is a water science and, and environmental consulting firm. We're located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, our headquarters. And our involvement with this kind of stemmed from sustainability work we were doing with Curie Green Mountain out in, in Vermont and surrounding areas um, several years ago. And we kind of got brought into the discussion when um, Neil and, and, and other folks at DEC kind of identified a need for tools to help again, with the tactical basin planning. So that's when we got involved, and eventually this turned into the Clean Water Roadmap for Vermont, which we'll be uh, presenting and rolling out today. And we've been really excited to be involved. It's been a great process, a very collaborative process. We've uh, collaborated closely with DEC, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Keurig, and it's been a really good uh, collaboration and partnership throughout as we've come up with ideas and, and kind of see what sticks against the wall and uh, gone forward and, and developed the version of the tool you'll see today. Um, so I'm going to walk through just a few introductory slides here. We're going to tag team a little bit. We'll have um, Dan Farrell from the Nature Conservancy talking about the water quality blueprint um, a little bit. And we'll have Philip Jones talking a little bit about um, overview for the TMDL and the uh, tactical basin planning process. So um, a few upfront slides, and then we're going to get into a hands-on demonstration where we'll be able to show you 
exactly what the tool can do and what it's intended for and Uh, so just a quick outline um, of, of what I'm mainly what I'm going to talk about. Just just briefly cover the objective and then the development process and timeline for this. Just give you an idea of what the process has looked like. We'll talk a little bit about key input components, and that'll include the phosphorus loading aspects of this that were generated from EPA's uh, modeling for the Lake Champlain Basin, and then also the water quality that's going to come in. Um, and then just a few slides, kind of. Um, bring you up to speed on how the phosphorus loadings in the water quality blueprints compare and contrast. They're not covering the same areas or the same topic areas necessarily that we've seen as very complementary instead. And then I'll just have a few notes on general capabilities and limitations, and then we'll get right into the demonstration. Uh, so just kind of simply stated the objective here that was developed um, back when we first just started discussing that was back in uh, summer and fall of 2015, uh, the objective was to support tactical basin planning and other nutrient management and conservation efforts by providing a planning and communication framework that can be used to prioritize watershed management actions and allocation of resources for reducing phosphorus delivery to Lake Champlain. Recognizing there's a lot that could be done in a lot of different places, what makes sense to, uh, to do in place X, Y, and Z. So that's the idea behind this, this tool. So just a few notes about development process and timeline. So we, again, we started this process, actually I think we had preliminary discussions back in spring of 2015. And then in September 2015, uh, we came out and, and uh, Tina Bosch and Kerry was here as well, and the Nation Conservancy and some other folks, and had meetings, I believe, in this very room uh, to kind of scope out what kind of developed the vision for what the tool would look like. So that really began the pro process in earnest, what we wanted to do, um, what that process would look like. And then we went and went back to uh, uh, our office and began to develop a specifications document for the tool that really laid out uh, A, B, and C. Here, here's what the tool will do and here's how it will be used and here are the um, inputs we need for it, so forth and so on. Uh, that took a few months because we had a lot of back and forth between us and DC and, and Curie, um, but eventually developed a final version of that in February of 2016. And then we began development of the tool in earnest last March, so about a year ago now. And that continued, the initial development continued through the summer of 2016. And then we got into more of a external review and testing period. So that's where EC and, and Curie, the Nature Conservancy, began to test the tool themselves and provide suggestions for improvement and tweaks. Um, we're still making tweaks today. I mean, we've, the tool is, is very close to what we consider kind of a final product at this point, but there'll be some minor tweaks still uh, over the next few weeks here. And then today is the, uh, the public roll-up. So in terms of key input components, really I've listed three things here. One is the downscale total phosphorus loads. Um, you see the answer there, or yields, uh, kilograms of phosphorus per year, or kilograms per hectare per year in terms of yield units per unit area. Um, and those were developed based on all the swap modeling that was done by EPA Region 1 for the Lake Champlain drainage area, really focused just on the Vermont portion of the drainage area here. So I'll note that. Um, and then those loads, um, we're downscaling those to the NHD plus catchment level, which um, we can talk about more later, but essentially that's kind of at the scale of medium, uh, NHD medium scale resolution stream. So it's quite a bit finer than the HUC-12 delineation in many locations. And that was kind of the level we identified jointly as being a good level to work at. We're not quite at the site-specific or parcel-specific level. Um, you don't really want to go there and recognize that the uncertainties we do that would be quite high. But I did feel um, pretty confident about downscaling the information to the NHD Plus level, again, to provide um, better information for targeting management <laughs> actions. Um, second, water, water quality blueprint scores. Uh, three elements of that, three components of that are in, in the roadmap conservation value, water quality impact, and then a combined score uh, from the, the two before it. Uh, so in just a minute, Dan Farrell is going to talk about uh, that in a little bit more detail, introduce that for you. And then to complement those two, we've got um, a series of relevant spatial layers, things like Vermont towns, counties, villages, um, uh, the stream network, and so forth. Um, 
just to kind of complement the other uh, pieces of information and allow you to kind of explore um, what's going on, on in, in this town or that town or this county and so forth. So um, just at a high level, those are the three components. And I think, Dan, I'll go ahead and turn this over to you. Great, thanks. Um, yes, I'm Dan Farrell from the Vermont chapter of the Nature Conservancy, and I'm the GIS analyst there. Um, and so the Nature Conservancy wanted to develop a tool that would prioritize the most important places in the Champlain Basin that can play a role in improving water quality. Our goal for the Water Quality Blueprint is to help organizations and the public focus on areas that provide the most benefit to water quality and conservation co-benefits. So we pr prioritize the floodplains and other river, lake, and wetland related areas for water quality improvement and conservation value. The blueprint is aimed at places that would benefit from the practice of protecting and restoring natural assets to improve water quality. It is not aimed at other practices such as cover crops or uh, controlling road erosion. Those practices are covered uh, in other parts of the, of the roadmap. The blueprint is really aimed at using the power of natural infrastructure to improve water quality. And this is something that is often called nature-based solutions. Like the Clean Water Roadmap, the water quality blueprint was developed with support from Cure Green Mountain. We received, oh, I have to go to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. you Oh, you have to do that. Yeah, okay. you should be able to click, yeah. Okay. Scroll. Oh, cool. So we received invaluable guidance from an advisory committee that includes people from state and federal government agencies, local nonprofits, and environmental consultants. And so we're not analyzing the entire basin. Uh, we're not analyzing the, all of the land area in the basin. We only, an, only analyze the riparian zone in the broadest sense, as well as existing and converted wetlands. The analysis area for the water quality blueprint is shown in brown on the left map. Um, so it is not a wall-to-wall -wall analysis of the basin. The map on the right shows the analysis area zoomed in and shown in dark gray. We wanted to focus on the key features that are close to water and have a lot of potential to store and filter runoff before it reaches surface waters. As Todd was saying, the blueprint consists of three products. The conservation value layer represents natural assets that will benefit from protection and restoration. The water quality impact value layer represents locations that are impaired or at risk of impairment. And these are impairments related to phosphorus. Um, a, com a combination layer that highlights opportunities to benefit both conservation and water quality goals. So to create the conservation value layer, we combine multiple mapped components to represent natural assets. I won't go through them all here. Uh, there are 13, I won't go them through them verbally here, but there are 13 components and they are all features that merit protection, such as important species and habitats. And some components count more than others, just say that um, in our analysis. So this is what the conservation value layer looks like at the basin scale in the map on the left. Red areas have high conservation value on this map. Green areas have low value, and yellow areas are somewhere in between. The high priorities stand out as expected. Um, the Missisquoi Delta in the northwest, Otter Creek Swamps in the south central area, um, and the lower reaches of the major rivers, Lamoille and Winooski, et cetera. And when you, zoom in, when you zoom in, you can see a lot of smaller sites that have high value, too. Um, so we, we used a similar method with the water quality impact value layer 
There are just five components. Unlike the components that fed into the conservation value layer, these components indicate areas that are at risk, have some sort of impairment related to phosphorus, or could abate, in, or could abate such impairments. And here is a water quality impact layer shown at the basin scale. There are a lot of yellow and green, uh, but the highest scores of red and orange are barely visible at this scale. Um, however, it does highlight areas that are likely to be important to water quality. And we combined the water quality impact and conservation value layers into one layer to highlight locations where there are opportunities to achieve both goals. And so that's what's showing here now. And finally, um, as Todd meant, as we have been talking about, the water quality blueprint is integrated into the clean water roadmap. Um, but it also can be viewed separately as an interactive web map where you can zoom into areas of interest like the clean water roadmap and, and view the three products. Um, as, but you can also view the underlying components and other supporting data. Since the Clean Water Roadmap does not include the underlying components of the Blueprint, the Blueprint web map is helpful for anyone who wants to really dig into the source data. And it includes a tutorial and some extra documentation. And I should note in closing uh, that the details of how the Blueprint was created uh, are relatively complex. And I don't have enough time to go over the details here. So I would encourage people who are interested in the details to look at the web map. Um, and, or the, the, web, the blueprint web map. Um, and also we're willing, uh, the, the Vermont chapter of the Nature Conservancy is willing, and me, uh, to go into more detail for interested organizations. <clears throat> That's all I have. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay, my name is Philip Jones. I'm with DEC. I'm an environmental modeler in MAP. And I'm going to talk very briefly about the context for this data that we're going to discuss and see in the Clean Water Roadmap. Um, it was brought to my attention that not everyone is intimately familiar with the obscure provisions of the Clean Water Act, which is what a world we live in. Um, so I'm going to briefly describe um, some of the history behind why we're here. And if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk with you in greater detail or point you to some documents that would um, provide a lot more information. So briefly, um, TMDL, which is a document that was completed for Lake Champlain, stands for Total Maximum Daily Load. It is a document which attempts to quantify the pollutant load on a daily time step that a surface water body can assimilate and still maintain designated functions. Um, designated functions, in the case of Lake Champlain, might be things like skin contact recreation, uh, aquatic biota, wildlife, habitat, um, other recreational uses, um, et cetera, et cetera. When a water body um, cannot meet its designated uses, it is called impaired. And that typically triggers a TMDL, which is designed to address um, diffuse or non-point pollution sources. So in the case of Lake Champlain, as with most TMDLs, there are a number of processes that have to take place. Um, you have to characterize the impaired water body and this watershed. Um, you have to identify the pollutant of concern. So why is the water body not meeting its uses? What is causing that? And then also the sources of that pollutant. Um, you need to identify or apply an appropriate water quality standard. So what is the water quality standard for the pollutant of concern, um, such that if the water body meets standard, um, we will restore designated uses. And then you need to link the pollutant loads to the water quality and identify the required source allocations. Um, so broadly, what that looks like is we have a watershed delivering a pollutant load to, in this case, a lake. There are internal processes within the lake that are um, further acting upon that pollutant load. That results in, in this case, a TP concentration in the water quality, in the water column. And that has the impact. The impact is what people actually care about. Um, my property value for my lake cabin has dropped by 20% because all of August, the bay is now covered in the inch of green slot. Um, we get fish kills, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's what people care about. And with most team deals, there are a number of different tools that are used at these various steps. Um, the data we're going to discuss today comes from a, a modeling framework called SWOT, which stands for Soil and Water 
assessment tool. Um, this is a, a very well established tool developed by USDA, it's the Agri Agricultural Research Center at Texas A&M. Um, it's been used a lot, so it's a very well established um, framework for, for modeling watersheds. What it is essentially is a watershed scale model that's designed to quantify and predict impacts of land management practices on water, sediment, nutrient loading, um, and it can be you know, done at a variety of different scales. In this case, what was done was individual swap models were, were fit for the major basins within the Vermont drainage. Um, in this case, the entire Lake Champlain drainage, but we're going to be focusing again on the Vermont basins. And SWAT for the, for, the L, for the Lake Champlain CMDL was used to quantify annual loads from the watershed. So what is coming off of the landscape into Lake Champlain? Um, in some cases, we had some lake segments that did not have monitoring data associated with them. So in that case, the estimates from SWAT were used to um, go into a second model called the bathtub model here, which was internally for the lake. Um, and then more importantly, it was SWAT was used to kind of go through some various scenarios. So if we alter management practice on the watershed scale, what is the predicted impact on phosphorus export? And how will that then impact the internal lake processes and resulting in a concentration and again, the impact on designated uses? So again, that's the scenario step where you make some changes into SWAT to see what happens to the export, run it back through into the lake, which was using a bathtub model. It's called bathtub. It was developed by Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you look at the resulting water quality standard to see if you're meeting that um, based on the management actions, and you go back and iterate through this process over and over again until you come up with some scenarios that um, hit the water quality standard targets. And so what I want us to do very quickly before we get into the downscale result is just show you an example of what the SWAT data actually looks like. So for uh, the Winooski Basin, and again, SWAT was run on a basin scale, but for each basin, um, Region 1 and Tetra Tech, the contractor who did this work, they delineated sub-basins within the larger basin, so those are the, the light gray lines, and then identified major river channels, and you can see the outlets for each sub-basin are the little orange dots. And in this case, what I did was just take SWAT's estimate for the 30-year average annual TP load and displayed that here. And the point I want to make is that for each of those sub-basins, um, that's the finest spatial scale that we have for the estimates from the model. So we can summarize data from SWAT at that scale, sub-basin scale. And you can see a graph of that looking at, in this case, TP load by a variety of different land classes. But we don't exactly know where those classes are within that subbasin. And so for the purposes of estimating loads from the watershed, it worked great. Um, from a management perspective, we felt that it was a little too coarse spatially to provide um, guidance. And so that's why we embarked upon this, this process to take the SWOT data, which was the basis for the TMDL, um, but downscale it in a way that would provide us with more information for management practice. And there's a question. Yeah, um, I can't. Uh, the print is too small on the SWAT sub, uh, sub basin 15. Can you read the, the items that identify the bar? Graph oh, the line class? Sure. So, again, this um, the largest one is four. So, from the top, it's unpaved roads, paved roads, residential, pasture, hay, forest, small farm steads, corn hay, rotations. Uh, continuous corn, and then commercial industrial. Um, and so again, th this was just kind of an example of broadly showing what SWAT looks like in its original form, what the data looks like, um, as a segue into the effort to downscale these data. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Todd. All right. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Uh, so just to follow on with what Philip said, for the next slide here, a little bit of this is redundant, but um, just to, as Philip said, the HUC-12 scale is really the scale, um, the base basin scale that the SWAT modeling was conducted at within those different basins or different hydrologic response units representing the model. And we don't need to get into a lot of detail what that means, but essentially those are common or lumped areas of common land use, soils, and slope conditions. Um, so we, that was kind of the raw materials we had to work with for the downscaling approach. And again, total, having total phosphorus loads at, at those scales to work from. Um, 
So the downscaling involved then translating the um, hydrologic response unit loadings down to the engine plus catchment scale. And if you look on the bottom, you can see on the left the HUC-12 type scale is an example, and on the right, then HD plus. It's a little bit hard to see the gray lines, but you can see that the delineation is, is finer. So that just gives you a sense. When we get into the tool demonstration, you'll see more clearly kind of the juxtaposition between those two scales. So um, when we get into the Clean Water Roadmap, we're dealing with three basin scales, the tactical basin scale at the highest level, uh, the HUC-12 scale, kind of the intermediate level, and the NHD Plus would be the finest level that we're dealing with. Um, and as an example, you know, the Winooski would be a tactical basin, the Mad River would be roughly a HUC-12, and then, for example, French Brook within the Mad River would be an NHD Plus basin. So just to give you a, an idea of that hierarchy. Um, so what we did, and this is something we worked, uh, Luminotech worked very closely with Philip on, and, and we, we, I think we came up with a, a pretty creative way to do this. We, we took kind of the raw GIS data that went into the swap models initially, um, ran summaries on that at a finer scale, and then we developed an algorithm that would essentially take the phosphorus loads from the original SWAT output and match those to different land uh, use soils and slope combinations at the finer scale. So um, we had kind of a hierarchy of rules that were applied to make that happen, and we're not going to go into detail about that today, but we just want you to understand that the loads in the representing the Clean Water Roadmap are not identical to the ones <laughs> in the SWAT model. They're a fairly close approximation, but not identical. Um, but we do feel like they're uh, reasonable estimates uh, for the downscale basins. And then just a few words to follow up on what, what Dan presented about the water quality blueprint, uh, just to <clears throat> kind of underscore some of the points he's already made. Uh, this graphic is just kind of depicting uh, spatially the differences between the phosphorus loading components of the Clean Water Roadmap and then the water quality blueprint components. So um, Dan used the, the phrase wall-to-wall. -wall. So the phosphorus loading information is wall-to-wall. -wall. It's in all the land area, all of the drainage basin, um, what are the loads from the different parts of the drainage basin. Um, but the blueprint is focused, both conservation value and the water quality impact um, scores are more um, focus on the riparian and floodplain zones, uh, wetlands, and uh, in-stream components. And so you can see on this graphic at the bottom here that this valley bottom region, and, and this is just conceptual graphics, so uh, it may not look quite right, but the idea is that the valley bottom uh, portions of the watershed are covered by the blueprint, although the blueprint does factor in some of the loading information too for water quality impact, but generally speaking, it's focused on this, this region of the watershed, and then the loadings represent the entirety of, of the, the drainage, ba drainage basin. So just wanted to underscore that point. And then in addition to some spatial differences in what's covered by the loads and the water quality blueprint, uh, in terms of content that drives those two components, there are some differences as well. And Dan listed some of these things on his slide, but there are some areas of of commonality that we're showing in this Venn diagram here. Examples would be soil erodibility and erosion risk type factors that would really feed into the phosphorus loads, but also are a factor that uh, TNC is considered in the water quality impact raster. And this is just for the water quality impact, not the conservation value. I should clarify that. Uh, other things such as, as listings, 303D listings for streams for phosphorus, those are a, a point of commonality between the two uh, components. And then I, we've already talked about the phosphorus yields. Um, but there are things that are factored into the water quality impact scores that Dan talked about that are not factored in um, really in any way to the phosphorus loadings. Examples would be restorable wetland sites and 303D listings for E. coli or other kind of non-phosphorus constituents. So, and then likewise, there are things that are factored into the, uh, uh, the loading estimates that are not really directly uh, affecting the water quality impact raster. So again, there's there's some areas of overlap between the two pieces, but there are uh, distinctions we need to draw between them two. And, and as a result, we see the two components or the three components really as being complementary to each other and um, different pieces of information and for different parts of the watershed. Um, so we're, we're approaching the demonstration here, but I just wanted to make a few points here before we do that. Uh, just kind of just kind of let you know what the tool is designed to do and also what it's not designed to do at this point. Um, not that it couldn't change in the future, but the current Clean Water Roadmap um, really 
does these four things uh, specifically. It leverages results from the TMDL modeling effort. Again, that's the SWAT modeling that uh, EPA Region 1 developed, um, as well as the scenario tool that complemented that where uh, different best management practice efficiencies were defined. We, we used all that information in this tool, again, using the downscaling approach. Uh, the tool will, will summarize baseline phosphorus, total phosphorus loads at multiple basin scales. We talked about three basin scales, tactical, HUC-12, and then HD+. And then it will allow BMP applications at those different scales for different land types. Um, and if you do um, apply some best management practices at the NHG plus scale, it will then aggregate those up to the coarser HUC-12 and tactical basin scales as well. And then finally, it, as we've talked about, it integrates the water quality blueprint. And that, that portion of the uh, tool really allows us to highlight opportunities for restoration conservation uh, that DC and others planners can use to um, factor in co-benefits and improvements to in-stream water quality, which, again, the phosphorus loadings on their own do not really give us. So, And then just a few notes on what the, the roadmap is not currently designed to do. So it does not provide any phosphorus loading estimates at scales finer than the NHD plus catchment that we talked about earlier. So um, again, we can't, can't get information at a site or parcel level scale at this point. And that was, was intentional um, by design, partly because of uncertainties associated with that and also sensitivities that might come about with that. Uh, so as a result, direct results number one, we can't use the tool to directly develop any site or partial level projects. The idea of the tool is to provide um, enough granularity in the loading estimates that easy to take that information and develop specific projects or um, curate develop specific projects to implement and have some guidance on where those should go and what the, what the uh, benefits to phosphorus loading reduction will be and also conservation benefits. Uh, also, there, there have been discussions before about the soluble reactive phosphorus component of the overall total phosphorus load. Uh, just to note that we're dealing at this point with total phosphorus only. We don't have any breakout for the soluble reactive components. So I wanted to note that. And then finally, we do not estimate the routing or delivery of total phosphorus to Lake Champlain uh, through the stream network. We're really, in terms of the loading component, it's really what's coming from the landscape into the stream network, and we're not attempting to convey that down to the lake. Um, but again, that's that's something that's been covered by EPA and its, its modeling efforts. So we're um, kind of considering um, that's kind of there in the background, but not directly treated in the tool. All right, so uh, uh, enough slide work. We'll, uh, we'll jump into the demonstration here. Um, just briefly, uh, we're going to go over. I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview of the web interface and some of the general capabilities. And then I'm going to hand off to Derek Schley. Uh, he's going to get into more details on some of the key core functionality of the tool, including uh, looking at best management practices and how they um, are applied or, or can be viewed for different land areas. And we have a version of the reasonable assurance scenario that EPA developed in this represented in the tool. So we'll, uh, he'll explore that a little bit, show what that looks like in terms of distributions of BMPs across Lake Champlain Basin, and then uh, the loading reductions that go along with those. And then we'll talk just a little bit with, about evaluating specific projects with the Clean Water Roadmap, and that's where we'll, we'll cycle back to Neil in terms of looking at the Lake Karma example he mentioned. So bear me with me while I kind of transition here. We've been online participation. <laughs> yeah, we've got 43, not counting me. Okay, so I understand there uh, there will be a link on this uh, to the site on one of DC's pages, web pages soon, and, and maybe an email blast or something like that. Yep, sure. Okay. Um, so we won't. Uh, get into details on exactly where to find the tool right now. Um, but this is the home page for the tool. Um, it's pretty uh, uh, pretty basic, just kind of inter briefly introduces the tool here. It has a, a sidebar menu where you can get to different parts of the, uh, the website. Um, at this point, you know, the, there are just a couple of complimentary pages that are there. Um, contacts page and a page where potentially we can post documents. Uh, we don't have anything there yet, but uh, likely there will be some information posted there uh, in the future. Uh, you'll note there is a login 
uh, option up here that's intended at this point for DEC planning staff as a, um, they need to have an account so that they can develop the kinds of scenarios we're going to show you today. Um, and then once those scenarios are published, then folks may go to the tool without any login needed and view what those look like in terms of uh, application of DMPs on the landscape. Um, so just to uh, briefly click through here, so uh, we've got a contacts page that has uh, Neil's information as well as Tim Clear's contact information. And uh, so you can go there uh, for their contact information. Again, a documents page right now, there's nothing listed here, but um, documents will likely be added to this, at least that's the current plan. And they'll be you know, downloadable PDFs or perhaps links to other, other sites as well. What's, a, what's an example of the type of documents that you would be including, for example? So it could be a user manual for the tool itself. Um, it could be links to EPAs, the Champlain Team DL, documents that are reported, um, things of that nature. Maybe additional things, you know. Link, yeah, I would think links to the explanation of the blueprint, so yeah, links over to Dan's site. Also, prospectively, might use it as a one-stop shop to put all the tactical basin plans that the agency publishes. They're already in one location on our website, but we could also just nest all those links into the Clean Water Roadmap tool. So, you know, if, if someone becomes a, a heavier user of the tool, they have all those right there. And certainly open to feedback of other things that, you know, you might want to see, your citizens might want to see. In there. Okay, so uh, there are a couple of options, few options to get into the tool itself. There's a link in the navigation bar at the top and then also on the sidebar. These all bring you to the same place. Uh, so go ahead and click on that. That will bring us into the uh, public version of the tool. Um, there's a little bit of a introduction uh, that comes up here as well as, as a user agreement which functions kind of as a disclaimer. Uh, the language on this will be probably tweaked, but just to let you know that will appear. And to kind of continue on to the tool, you need to press the I agree button. If you hit decline, it boots you back to the, the home page we're looking at. So um, I will note an oversight. We, we need to incorporate the Nation Conservancy's logo onto the main page, so we'll be doing that uh, soon as well. So I'll go ahead and click I agree. Um, so just to uh, going to kind of give you a, a brief tour of, of what's here, and then again, we're going to get into more details as we go along. Um, but we've got a few different panels here. We've got kind of our map viewport uh, here in the center. We've got a map layers panel here. Talk about that in a minute. And then a tools panel. Kind of access more of the more of the functionality of the tool. And then the bottom of catchment dashboard where you can get uh, information for specific basins you've uh, selected on the map. Um, any of these panels can be adjusted just by dragging dragging the sliders at the edge, so you can see how that works. Uh, you can also collapse these panels if you wanted more map real estate, you can collapse the panels, uh, but you will need to have those expanded in order to get to the various options, of course. Uh, so now I'm going to go through each individual panel and kind of highlight some of the, the key aspects of that, uh, each one of those. Um, so you can see by default the map comes up with a delineation of the entire Lake Champlain uh, basin boundary. That's the black line here. Uh, the blue lines indicate the tactical basin uh, boundaries in Vermont. Um, although we have the entire basin shown, again, I want to reemphasize that we are only covering uh, the Vermont portion of the drainage basin. There are no portions of New York State included or Quebec, um, so it's just Vermont. We've stripped out the other information. Um, the map has basic basic navigation capabilities, so you can just click and drag to uh, pan around on the map. You can uh, zoom out using the buttons here. Uh, you can also press the the home button, um, which will bring you out to the full full extent of the map. Uh, we also have this search capability here, and if you want to get quickly to a specific town or catchment, you can start typing the name of that town or catchment, and it'll be a, a fast way to jump to that. Uh, so, for example, if I wanted to uh, jump to Montpelier, type that in and select that, and we'll zoom right into the town there. 
And likewise, you can do that for any stream. We're looking for Mad River or French Brook, like we mentioned earlier. Okay, then moving on to the map layers pane here to the left. So you can see the various layers we've kind of introduced through the slide deck we went through. Um, things like NHD streams can be added to the map, uh, village boundaries, town boundaries, county boundaries. And then we've got our three different basin scales, or actually four, I guess, uh, Lake Champlain Basin being that, that black outline um, being at the highest level. The TACO basins, HUC-12 basins, and NHD plus catchments. I'll note that you can, if, it, if the layer has been selected here, you can simply uh, press this button and expand it and you'll get information, a legend, on what the symbology used on the map, uh, or the symbology is used on the map. You can also modify the opacity, which basically can make the, the layer semi-transparent or entirely transparent. So if I drag that around, you can see the lines have disappeared. So these are, are things that are usually available on web maps. I just want to highlight that they're there. And then we've got a, an info tab along with each layer that just provides a very brief um, kind of note on what the layer represents or involves. So that can be done for any layer. Um, you can see down here our last three layers are the blueprint elements. So these will look familiar from what Dan showed on the screen a little while ago. And again, you can expand these layers and uh, look at information, the information provided here, or the legend again showing uh, what the different colors mean in terms of the scores. Um, I will note that there are these information icons kind of scattered throughout the tool. Some of them need to be clicked on, others can be hovered on. For example, if I hover over the conservation value um, option here, I'll have a uh, description come up of that particular layer and what's involved with it. And I believe all of these for the Water Quality Blueprint also have a link to their uh, TNC's website that they've developed dedicated to the blueprint. Where again, you can get more information on the various components that go into it. Okay, and then. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, let's just take conservation value. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm from Catholic. And uh, let's say a community risk assessment team or committee that wishes to assess that value for the town of Cabot. Is that, does this have the capacity to do that? It's not going to give you a summary at the town level specifically, but for the, the I guess, mm -hmm. those NHD plus catchments, which mm -hmm. um, will not sort of be, they won't be congruent with the town boundary, but you'll be able to look at those bases in that area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing you'll do that we've, or you'll see that we've done is we have taken the uh, information that Dan and Rose and their group have developed and then calculated aggregate scores for the basins. So you can get, we'll show in a minute, you can look at um, kind of the color gradient for that conservation value over the various basins. So you can kind of target areas based on that. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll kind of get at what you're, what you're asking. I have a question. Yes. Your loadings are for quality. Is there any idea of area of concern for those areas, like cropland or, in other words, how much area in that category is dedicating to a production of phosphorus? You mean specific land, land use groups? Well, well you're grouping there. We have, we have the loads broken out by those different categories, if that's, if that's what you're asking. But areas of would, land use. I would say stay tuned. He's going to get there. OK, yeah. I'm sorry. He, he is. He's going to get there. What you're asking for is definitely in there. While you're, while you're in there, could you click on the uh, the layer for the NHDP PDD plus? Uh, oh, for the catchments? Sure. Yeah, thanks. I meant to do that. And then actually, I have to hook 12 too, so you can kind of see the, the difference here between the two. So the red lines are the, the NHC Plus, and the orange lines are the, the hook 12 basins. So you can kind of see the relative scale there. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll be showing. Just to, just to telegraph, sir, the answer, uh, unanswer to your question is depending on what scale you have selected, when you go in there and you click an area, 
and you get those pie charts, you can go further and further and further and see what the loads are, how much area is in that polygon in that area. So, Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on to the, uh, unless there are any other questions, I'll move on to the, the tools panel over here where things get a little bit uh, more interesting and more uh, just interactive from a user's perspective. Uh, so we've got some expand, expandable, collapsible uh, panels over here. Uh, the first one is overview topics. And again, these are just links to some brief documentation, kind of some light documentation on uh, the TMDL itself. A few, a couple of links here to websites. Uh, the Clean Water Roadmap, and then the Water Quality Blueprint. So this provides kind of a synop overall synopsis of the Water Quality Blueprint. Provides again a link to TNC's website, the Blueprint. Move down to the uh, Visualize Basins tab down here, and again uh, we have some information icons here. That's kind of the inline documentation we've developed. And so you can click on there and get more information about what a specific option is or what you can do with a particular option. Um, but we've got a few different options here, and these are all directed at what's being shown on the map. So um, here we've got map type right now. This is only showing baseline. You'll see when we get into scenario mode, uh, it's noted down here that we'll have additional options for that menu. Uh, but right now we just have baseline. Uh, you can select your basin scale. So, for example, I'm going to select Puck 12 here. And so the rest of the, uh, the options here are kind of dictating what's being shown for that particular basin. So right now we're, we're plotting phosphorus loading information for all land types, and we're specifically plotting uh, total phosphorus yield in kilogram per hectare per year. And, and once you have that selected, you can also, again, go back and look at the legend to see what what the various colors represent. So what does the red represent? It would represent uh, yields within a range of 0.64 to 2 kilogram per hectare per year. We're using kind of a quantile approach, so we've got five five bins defined, so you'll, you'll see consistent colors on the map no matter what you're selecting. Does that make sense? It would be helpful if folks <clears throat> who aren't right around the table in the room ask a question, if you could just repeat oh, it, sure. um, just because they're a little further away from the microphone. Sure. Thanks. Uh, there are different color schemes you can use here as well, and we have uh, kind of a green to red or blue to red uh, continuum here. Uh, this green, in the case of the uh, the green to red, the red is, is always representing the higher values, and the green is representing the lowest values. And then you have some some, some colors falling in between there as well. Uh, we also have an option for folks who may have color blindness uh, to allow them to be, a, be able to better resolve differences on the map. So that's that option. We're looking at total yield right now, but as an example, we could switch to any of the options on this list. So total load, for example, and you'll see differences in the map. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we have uh, to the NHD Plus scale and the HUC 12 scale, we have done some aggregation of the water quality blueprint scores. So areas that are scored uh, for conservation value or water quality impact, essentially we're calculating average values for um, HUC 12 and NHD Plus catchment. So you can see I'll, I'll select conservation value here. And it'll uh, show up on the map. We did not do that at the tactical basin level because I think that it probably loses quite a bit of meaning at that point. You're at such a broad scale, you really don't know what you're looking at or what those scores mean. They tend to be very similar anyway. Uh, also note that uh, we're looking at all land types, but if you were interested in just looking at the distribution of loadings due to cropland or pasture and hay or developed areas, you could do that using this, this option here. So if I select, select just cropland, you'll see some differences in the map. What that's doing is only looking at the areas within each, each of those basins, to these HUC-12 basins, uh, that has, uh, or just the areas that are cropland, uh, land use type ignoring developed areas, ignoring forest, et cetera. And likewise, we could, we could select uh, developed here. Could you, could you briefly uh, overview the difference between yield and load for people? 
Now everyone may be familiar with the distinction there. Sure, sure. So, so when we look at total load here, we're talking about the total mass of phosphorus that's moving off, off a particular part of the landscape over the course of a year. So we use, we use units of uh, kilograms per year for that, and that's what we're using in the tools. So total mass of phosphorus. Um, the yield is essentially the normalized load. So you take the total load, kilograms per year, and divide by the total area that that load is, is coming from. Um, so I won't try to put a numeric example together on the fly, but <laughs> essentially um, you're taking the total load, dividing by the area that load is originating from, and that's what we call the yield. So um, it's a way to kind of potentially more, more fairly judge the relative impact of different areas that might have very different <clears throat> actual areas, a different basis that have different areas. So, so one point that's come up with this in the past, the point of confusion, is that you may look at a spatial unit and see very high loads of forest. And people think, well, does that mean forest is bad? Um, no, it doesn't. Um, what it means is that you've got a lot of forest in the area, and that forest is contributing a large load because there's a large spatial extent of forest in the area. If you look at the yield, it's going to be looking at the load per, per area. And the yield on most forested lands can be very low because there may be a lot of forests contributing a large load, but in terms of being concentrated, it's very diffuse, right? So it's good to keep that distinction in mind because I feel the question of people are saying, forest is a problem here. And it's not a problem. Um, it's a contributor naturally to phosphorus loading, but the reason you see a big load is because there's a lot of it right here. So that's that's why I'd ask for that distinction to keep that in mind. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And Andy. may I ask a question? Sure. How do you um, put in, in terms of yield, the precipitation and the runoff? In other words, from forest you may get a high yield or low, low yield, yield, but there's a lot of infiltration. So, so SWAT accounts for those in its modeling framework. So it takes into account climate and other weather variables and other soil factors as well. So when it comes to the estimates of how much is coming off of a hydrologic response unit, it does take those into account. Um, we don't have that into the tool. And so as, as Todd mentioned, we're not talking about routing or delivery ratios. We're just talking about what's coming off of a land surface. But in terms of the original estimates, SWAT well, does account for things like precipitation patterns, uh, other climate variables, um, sure. and soil characteristics. So it's certainly factored into this. It's just not, you don't see it explicitly on here, but that is what's driving the yields uh, runoff. So it's already factored into the yield. Yes. Yep. I, I have a question. Sure. And it's really about ag land. So if you've got a, 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 a high amount of acreage um, per cow, let's say, for a crop, are you taking into account, though, that it's underlain with some surface top, it's a ditch, which could, you know, make the added acreage per cow seem like vast and excellent, let's say, for a nutrient management plant, and yet, you know, there's actually high input from phosphorus. Because I see that in ag lands in the base of the world with monitoring. There is co sampling. You see high phosphorus, high nitrogen, high total suspended solids on the end that has a superb stellar nutrient because of the high amount of acreage per cow, for instance. I mean, is that relevant to you? But the scales we're working on, we don't we don't have the distinction between drained and non tile drained areas. Um, I can't recall if that's factored into the, the modeling um, at the very finest scale. <laughs> You want to take it, Eric? Well, we'll go ahead. I'll sure. Um, yeah, so Cree, the model does not actually account for tile. We don't have a method of mapping and knowing where lands are tiled or not, and we're learning rapidly about that. That's an area of active research within the Lake Champlain Basin Program, to be looking at the influence of tile. The research is sort of all over the map, though the data I've seen are similar to what you describe of relatively high concentrations, sometimes stellarly high coming out of tiles. Other times not, though. Um, so because we had no framework to be able to 
make any kind of assumptions about what is or is not tiled within this modeling framework. We didn't, and I believe that's how you all handled it when you created the original SWAT model at EPA, right, Eric? Well, with the exception that I believe Tetra Tech um, used the same estimate as Stone Environmental did for Missisquoi Bay in okay. terms of um, taking a, this was not by any means an exact estimate of the amount of tile drainage, but they used a, a little um, formula that took into account topography and soil type and developed okay. an estimate uh, based and wide of, of an amount of area that could be tile drained. Um, but I forget exactly how that was incorporated into the modeling, but I know it's discussed in one of the reports. Just to add one other piece of information is that what the SWAT model is, what the SWAT model has done though is it has balanced the books between what SWAT believes is coming off the landscape and what we measure at the river mouth. So we have a, a team that has been measuring the river mouth for over 20 years. We have very precise data as to how much phosphorus comes out at the Missisquoi, at the Lamoille, at the Winooski. And so the books are balanced at the Huck 12 scale um, in terms of, of that. So if it's right or wrong, it's right or wrong in the same direction everywhere for having you know, not done tile. And that gets back to what I said about putting boots on the ground and eyeballs on the landscape before doing investments. Um, yeah, I was just going to comment on that too, Neil. So I know Keurig, Keurig has funded a project. We're going down the site scale. Tile drainage was recognized as a specific problem. And so that was taken into consideration when developing the project. For that specific location, um, the scale we're working at here again is 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 somewhat limited, just kind of to give information to point you in the right general locations to work in. And then, like Neil said, the next step is for for EC and their teams to go in and, and decide exactly what makes sense to do on a given parcel of land. Um, Okay, well, I, I think uh, we've highlighted kind of the different map map options here, and then I'll just note, uh, Derek's going to get into this more detail in just a moment, but um, regarding scenario options, um, we've been looking at baseline mode, so these are the phosphorus loads downscaled from the calibrated SWAT models for the basin, representing more or less current day loading situation. Um, when we talk about scenarios, we're talking about anything that might be changing the loading, reducing the loading due to best management practices being applied in various parts of the watershed. Uh, different types of, of BMPs in, in different locations. Um, and we'll, we'll get into this more detail, but you can see if I pull down the menu here, we've got a couple, a uh, few listed RA scenario. Uh, is an example of a very broad scenario that, that kind of touches all the all the different areas of the, of the basin, Vermont portion of the basin, as, as well as outside of Vermont. Um, we've got also some more focused scenarios that look at specific cases where we want to look at a project in one location or another. Um, so the point I want to make is that these scenarios can be either very broad or very focused or anywhere in between. There's a lot of flexibility there. Um, I'm not going to click on a scenario right now, but I just wanted to, to highlight that. And Derek's going to talk about scenarios in more detail in just a moment. To wrap up my piece here, I'll just note that um, finally, the final pane we've got here, there are some ways to get the information from the tool into an Excel spreadsheet. So if you'd like to dig into the details and look at the loadings in more uh, uh, detailed fashion and work with them, um, you can download the information. There's a menu you can bring up where you can export different scenarios, including the baseline, select different basin types, for example, I want to export everything for the Lamoille uh, tactical base, and I could do that, press export, and you'll get a, a spreadsheet generated that you can work with. I will say we have a lot of graphics built in that we haven't gotten to yet, but built into the Clean Water Roadmap, so you can do a lot on screen. That's kind of the idea, but certainly the options there for, for downloading information as well. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Derek Schlee, who's going to go through a, a little more detail on uh, some of the core functionality with respect to um, the scenarios and getting at basin-specific information. Uh, okay, thanks, Todd. Again, I'm, I'm Derek Schlee, also from Limno Tech, and um, I'm going to 
Yeah, just just keep trucking along while we're in, in baseline mode here um, and show you how how a public uh, user might access the information in this tool. Um, I'm going to switch to the, the Huck 12 basin for in scale for an example that I'm going to go through. Um, and, and I'm going to go back to uh, uh, Montpelier as well. And this, uh, I think a question was asked earlier about uh, Cabot, I guess. So this is how you might um, zoom to a specific town or location um, to get a feel for just the, the drainage areas or the catchments uh, within the boundaries of that town or county or even tactical basin and then um, click, start clicking around to get more information. So, so in this example, I, I zoom to the Montpelier boundaries and I'm going to click this Huck 12 catchment. Um, this is called Sodom Pondbrook. And, and if you notice when I did that, uh, new information popped up in, in this catchment dashboard down below and I'll, I'll drag this uh, so you can see everything. I, I realize the print's small so I'll try to explain everything with, with the words or numbers are and, and what they might mean. And, and it, if I click on a neighboring catchment, for example, you'll see the information updates um, hopefully pretty rapidly with the, the data for that particular catchment. So the, the pie charts down here will update as I click around, as will the numbers in the table. So there, there's two main pieces of information in the catchment dashboard. There's a, a baseline summary table to the left and two pie charts to the right. So in the baseline summary table, uh, what we have in, in the rows are the various metrics um, that are being plotted uh, like, like Todd was demonstrating, except now it gives you the values behind those metrics. And, and a, a sixth one was thrown in is, is just the area, the land area for that catchment. So the first two are total phosphorus load and total phosphorus yield. Um, and then the last three are the water quality blueprint components, so the actual values for this particular catchment. Um, and, and then that, that's the values are in the second column, and then the third and fourth columns are a percent rank. So this is a ranking from zero to 100, uh, how this particular catchment compares to to um, other catchments in the tactical basin. That's the third column. Um, so for example, this one has a mean TP yield that's ranked about 87 out of 100. So it's a relatively high total phosphorus yield ranking within the Winooski tactical basin. And then also ranking it out of the entire Vermont portion of the Lake Champlain Basin area. And so are, are those clipped to the town boundary, or is it just basin-wide? Uh, th these are not clipped to the town boundary, so let me get rid of that there. Um, so that you see the yellow highlight, that's the boundary that it's representing. Well, sub-basin. That's, that's right. Um, so so the, other, the, the pie charts then are, are really breaking down two numbers in this table a little further. The first pie chart is, is breaking down this total phosphorus load. So if you can't read this, which most of you probably can't, um, it, it's around 4,000 kilograms per year on average total phosphorus coming off this basin according to the SWAT modeling work. Um, but, but this pie chart tells you, I, I think an earlier question, where that's coming from. So, so the brown pie is cropland, and if you hover over one of those, it gives you the exact numbers. That's around 29%. Uh, yellow is pasture hay developed is the pink, uh, gray is roads, and, and green is forest. So it's kind of in a relatively equal split uh, between, between five major land classes in terms of total phosphorus load, uh, but, but agricultural, cropland, and pasture hay are roughly half combined. Uh, the second pie chart is the land area for those land classes. Um, so here you can see uh, green jumps out uh, as the, the dominant. It's almost 60% of the land area is forested in this particular catchment, and if you're from the area, that probably or hopefully makes sense. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, the summary table, and, and there's this blue link that says show subbasins. So if I click on this, um, this will also demonstrate, I, I think, a feature that someone was inquiring about earlier. So when I click on that, it brings up a listing of all the NHD plus catchments or the finer catchments uh, within this Sodom Pondbrook Huck 12 basin. And it, and it further breaks down the values for all of these metrics uh, in, in this table for each of these individual uh, smaller catchments or NHD plus catchments. And any of these columns is sortable by clicking on the black arrows. So if I wanted to know which had the highest total phosphorus yield, for example, I could click this column and then it'll sort those from, from highest to lowest um, to, to see the top three or five uh, highest total phosphorus yielding catchments. And the same is true for the water quality blueprint components. 
Um, so I, I think a question was asked, uh, what, you know, if I'm working in my town where I might I identify the catchment with the highest conservation value, and you could use a tool just just in that regard to, uh, to sort and say, okay, these three to five catchments have the higher highest water quality blueprint conservation value according to the work that TNC did. Um, and, and there's also an option to export this table to Excel as well, just like uh, the export that Todd highlighted earlier, so you could work with the data to create more plots or tables on your own if, if you wanted to. And can, can you look at the visual picture of that too? Of? Based with all the sub. So the catches, small you can. Yeah. Right, so I, I think if I um, click this NHD Plus catch, it might, it might take a while to load, um, but, but I, could, I could switch to NHD plus catchment scale over here, and then you get a feel for um, wh where those might fall, where those particular catchments might fall, because that, yeah, that's kind of the missing link. Okay, I, I know which catchment it is, but where is it located? Right, because I mean, here's what I can see. You could put on your town boundaries and say, okay, which is the part of the town where we need to focus some of our efforts or whatever. But that, that's right, yeah. Yeah, the more granular one. Like, yeah, so, so, so these three catchments in, in the Mount Pelier, you know, tend to have the highest total phosphorus yield. Uh, according to the, the SWAT modeling work. Um, uh, okay, so let me go back to this HUC-12 catchment one more time. And, and next I'm going to demonstrate what we call the total phosphorus loading window. Uh, so, so I can click on any of these wedges in either pie, and a new window will appear with even greater breakdown of the total phosphorus loading uh, with, within this HUC-12 basin. So it, it, um, there, there's two panels here. The, the one on the left just gives the land classes um, and, the, and the numbers that were driving the values in this pie chart, if you will. So those are the same as when I was hovering over the pie chart. Um, and then on the right, there's two tabs, a baseline and a BMP tab. Um, and, and when I click on any of these rows to the left, the information in the baseline tab is going to update as well as the information in the BMP tab. So if I clicked on just the HUC-12 basin level, this pie chart's exactly the same. Uh, is the one you see below. But if I wanted to narrow in on, on cropland, for example, I click on that and it gives further information of the cropland types that are represented uh, with, within the cropland land category for this catchment. And, and again, these are probably hard to read, but the, uh, in, in this particular catchment, it looks like uh, corn hay rotation on non clay soils contribute um, close to 60% of the total phosphorus load. Um, and then cor corn hay on clay soils are, are another 23%. So a good chunk is, of the load is coming off corn hay um, rotations. And that could be that they just represent the biggest cropland area um, for this particular catchment. And again, I can do that for, for any of these land categories. Um, roads, for example, will give you the breakdown between paved roads, unpaved roads, and, and actually driveways was represented in the SWAT model as well. Can you get yield from that too? Um, you well, so so right now it's giving the total load and, and not the area, but um, I, I forget if that I think that's one of the features of that export tool that I uh, you know didn't didn't get into. But um, if, if you would export to an ex, to an Excel file, then you might look at it in terms of yield. Well, yeah, I, I guess I was mistaken. So there is a yield um, right here for roads combined, and then I, I guess you could. Uh, break that down based on the percentages of the pies, but that's a, that's a good question. So so here's the, the yield um, for roads, it's 2.1 kilograms per hectare. For cropland, you know, the, the total load is 1,100 kilograms per year, and that amounts to 1.7 kilograms per hectare. That's a good question. Um, so, so the other feature in, in this TP loading window is a BMPs tab, or best management practices. So for any uh, land class, this is just a listing of the typical um, best management practices that are uh, represented in the clean water roadmap or might typically be applied for that uh, particular land group. So for cropland, you have things like uh, changing the crop rotation, conservation, tillage, cover crops, conversion to hay, uh, riparian buffers, ditch buffers, etc. And if I switch to develop, for example, it will give more storm water type best management practices uh, like biofiltration, constructed wetlands, and also uh, banning fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer on turf or lawns is, is one of the top uh, BMPs, I guess, for developed land uses as well. It's worth, worth noting that uh, these are all uh, 
consistent with what's shown in the scenario tool that EPA developed, um, but the, the roadmap could be expanded to include more BMPs if more were identified with specific reductions for different situations. So just want to note that the flexibility is there, but right now this is is really uh, based strictly on the uh, scenario tool. Yeah, this was probably covered before we got into the apologize. The word, could you define the word catchment? I mean, I have a sense of what it is, but if you can show an example. Yeah, I, I could do that. And, and I'm, as I wrap up this part, I'll, I'll do that in a minute or two. Maybe okay. let me ask, answer this yeah. question in case. Uh, so BMP, um, with regard to uh, pesticide, insecticide use, um, with those uh, Things getting into the soil, potentially dislodging phosphorus, is that been something that's been addressed? So I'm thinking particularly. I'm, I'm Craig Zondek from New Haven, and uh, at a recent um, select board meeting, they put someone in charge of roads to begin some what of a, an abatement product program for poison parsnip, and uh, this person thinks that Roundup is going to be the cure for that. Um, so I, you know, concerned about you know what what's the role of Roundup in, uh, you know, especially along rivers and roads and and, and that sort of thing, and how that's going to affect uh, the lodging phosphorus in the soil. That's a good question, a good point. I think a good potential unknown. Um, I, I'm guessing, and, and maybe others could correct that the the SWAT modeling work that estimated the total total phosphorus loads did not account for that in any way. You know. In, insecticide or pesticide applications and, and the implications on release of phosphorus or contribution to phosphorus loading. So so that, you know, right now in, in the Clean Water Roadmap is is not re represented in, in any way, but, you know, that's maybe a future enhancement uh, that could be added as we improve our understanding on, on issues like that. Um, a good question. So I, I'm going to kind of wrap up this baseline mode and transition into a scenario mode. Um, but but before doing that, I'll let me let me zoom out to answer that catchment question one more time because it's it's a it's a good point. Um, well, it's a good transition to show. I, I was just working at the Huck 12 catchment scale, but but there's three catchment scales. There's um, what we call the tactical basin. So if I switch to that, um, there's and let me turn off the town boundaries. There's six tactical basins in the Lake Champlain drainage area for Vermont, and they're, they're shown here, Winooski, Lamoille, et cetera. And if I add the Huck 12 uh, basins, that's the next finer uh, resolution um, of, of drainage area. And, and you can see how the map got a little finer there. Oh, sorry, I might take a minute to load. Yeah. And and then NHD plus means the, the next finer resolution, so e even um, even finer. And, and I guess roughly to give you numbers, I looked at this earlier. I, I think there's about 18 Huck 12 catchments per tactical basin. So within the Winooski, there's roughly 18 Huck 12 catchments. And then within a given Huck 12 catchment, there's on average 15 to 20 uh, NHD plus catchments. We're using basin and catchment somewhat interchangeably too. Right. So yeah. if we uh, mix those up, but I, they're basically synonymous. Okay. Um, so, so I'm going to switch to scenario mode again. Everything we've been looking at so far is is uh, what the SWOT modeling work and what the measured data are telling us are the, the baseline conditions of total phosphorus loading from from these various watersheds. So if I if I use scenario mode, um, I, I'm going to start with the. Ex this example of the RA scenario or the reasonable assurance scenario. Um, and, and that, again, I think Todd and, and Philip have both covered that, but that represents a scenario developed by EPA Region 1 uh, that says how the total, uh, the TMDL phosphorus load reductions might reasonably be met through land management actions. Um, and you notice when I clicked on that, nothing really changed in the map or nothing changed in the catchment dashboard. But it, but in the background, the new features that come with scenario mode have been activated, if you will. So I'll start with the, the map type. So now there's two other options other than baseline. It, they're, they're scenario and reduction. So if I switch to scenario, uh, you'll see that the map color should change to look better. Greener is, is better in this case. So, so under the RA scenario, uh, kind of across the, the board, uh, the total phosphorus yields is what we're looking at now have been re reduced. 
to an amount that will result in achieving the TMDL phosphorus load reduction targets. The other option is to change to reduction, and that's just the difference between the two. So that's the, the baseline yield minus the scenario yield uh, tells you how much total phosphorus was reduced. So, and, and this um, this kind of makes sense in the Missisquoi and down in the Southern Lake Champlain and, and Otter Creek Tactical Basins is where the, the greatest phosphorus reductions are needed and therefore were achieved with this RA scenario. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Huck 12 Basin scale and then I'm going to go back to that catchment we were looking at as an example. Um, okay, So I'll go ahead and click on that catchment and, and load the information in the catchment dashboard. And, and here, uh, nothing has changed. This is still the, the baseline information in the summary table, the baseline information in, in the pie charts. So, so what has changed, if you click the show subbasins and, and bring up the subbasin inventory for that Huck 12, we now have two new columns in this table. Uh, one is the scenario total phosphorus load and the scenario total phosphorus yield. So to the left, you have the baseline load and baseline yield. So, so you can see for any given NHD plus catchment what the load, absolute load reduction was and what the yield reduction was. Um, and you could, again, export this table to Excel, and if you wanted to say, okay, which had the greatest percent reduction, you could do some computations on your own like that. But right now, the Clean Water Roadmap's not doing that. Um, and then I'm going to click on a wedge again to bring up the total phosphorus loading window. So, so what's different here, um, it, it might be hard to see, but there are percent reductions in red text. Um, so overall, for this Huck 12 basin, the RA scenario is suggesting that a 39% reduction in the total phosphorus load uh, can be achieved, um, and, and that results in a load of about 2450 kilograms per year. So that, that number has been updated as well. If you look back in the table below, it, it was still at the 4,000 kilograms per year of total phosphorus for the basin. And then also the, the where those reductions are coming from uh, are listed for each of the land categories. So for for this example, it looks like farmsteads and, and cropland have relatively high phosphorus reduction, and something like roads and forests have relatively low reduction at 12 and 5 percent. Where are those scenarios described? Say that again. Or, where are these scenarios described? Um, I'll, so, so I'll get I'll get I'll get into that right now, I guess. So, so in this in this BMPs tab, the content has changed to give you that information. What what best management practices were applied? Um, under this scenario. So, so in this example, um, and, and it gives a, a percentage. So, so the biggest management practice is assumed to be a combined uh, management actions for cropland that includes cover crops, conservation tillage, manure injection, grass water waste, and riparian buffer. So five management practices stacked on top of each other being applied to about 58% uh, of the cropland in this basin. There, there's some other BMPs listed that are the first two are just deviations uh, of that with a, a different management practice mixed into the five, and the last is a land use conversion to hay, which is only falls on one percent of of the cropland, which might happen to be a, a high sloping, like greater than ten percent type cropland, where they're assuming that that should be converted to hay instead of row crop. Um, so that's the information in the BMPs tab, and if I clicked on any of the other land uses, that again will update. So for pasture hay, the assumption is. 15% of the area will have uh, livestock exclusion with riparian buffers, and another 65% six, receives riparian buffers only for pasture hay land classes. Yep. Derek, um, this is Rose from the Nature Conservancy. I had the chance to preview this great tool yesterday, and I noticed um, for the cropland and for the pasture hay land use categories, there's no um, BMP option to say perhaps some percent of that land would be converted to um, forest or wetland. It, there's only the riparian buffer option, and I wonder if that could be built in in the future. So, so that's a good question. So it actually, it actually is built in, but just not for this particular scenario. So I, I could actually bring up an, another scenario um, that will demonstrate that, um, but but it is it is built in. So you, you did see the conversion to hay, but there's also options for for someone at the planning level to go in and, and specify 
conversion to forest or wetland, grassland, you know, non-cropland type uses. Okay. But yeah, that's a good question. It just doesn't happen to be part of the RA scenario for this particular base. And I think in the Missisquoi it might be uh, a specified conversion to grassland, but don't quote me on that. Um, we, we would have to navigate to see whether or not that's true. Um, so the other, the other new tab is, is a compare tab. And this is a, a simple stacked bar chart with the baseline total phosphorus loads on the left and the scenario total phosphorus loads on the right. And the different colors represent, at, at, at this category, it's the land use group. So, so you can see you know, visually the reduction in, in cropland, which is the brown from, from the baseline to what it is in the scenario. It, it, it gives you a feel for where the biggest reductions were achieved, whereas forest you know, looks pretty much the same, but, but there was a 5% reduction in the forest total phosphorus loading. And if I clicked on any of the um, land group categories, it gives a, a more detailed breakdown, uh, again, of the land categories represented for cropland. So I would have to hover over this to see, but um, in this case, corn hay on non-clay soils received a relatively large reduction. There's one question online. What is the buffer width that is used in the scenario? That's a good question, and I don't have that off the top of my head. It was standard. Is it 25 feet for streams, 10 feet in most cases for ditches? Okay. It's the RAP buffers, so the buffers right. specified by the new required agricultural practices. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, is there a way to adapt the model to see, well, what if you had 50 foot? Like our easements all have 50 foot buffers on. Yeah, so, so the way the, the best management practices work is is right now, for a parian buffer, for example, there's just a somewhat of a fixed total phosphorus reduction based on, on that typical, um, I, I guess, for, for wetlands, for example, you know, there, there is some flexibility there that could be built in for buffers to say, you know, a 25 foot versus a 50 foot buffer. So that would be a future enhancement. Um, let me let me switch to developed. Actually, I, I think you might not be able to read it, but um, so so here for for developed management practices, it does give some of that flexibility. So for biofiltration, saying if you're uh, designing your biofiltration to treat a half an inch storm versus a one inch storm versus a two inch storm. So it's kind of an equivalent that's built in for developed uh, land use management practices, but it, it's not in there for um, repairing buffers in terms of a width. Because I know that, you know, we're doing a lot of work to capture, as Chris Hammer from BHCB, to capture in terms of the land that we're conserving how much has stream frontage, how much of that stream frontage is now going to be buffered by easements. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to say that, you know, our easements are requiring more than the, the RAPs. And if we could quantify, you can serve land with a 50 foot buffer, you're going to get this much more phosphorus reduction than if it was just an RAP. And I mean, we go to the legislature all the time trying to justify our existence. And I think that's part of our argument, but we haven't had any data to make that argument. You know, it sounds like if there's a possibility to do that. I mean, maybe the, the data is too coarse to get to that fine detail. But there's there is functionality in the Clean Water Roadmap tool, but in sort of the internals of it to modify the practice efficiencies. Mm -hmm. So in the state's accounting and tracking system for phosphorus projects that go on the ground, like your easements, mm -hmm. we actually in that accounting system, which is a little bit separate from this. Um, would account for the actual width of the buffer, the actual length of the buffer, the actual density of the, the planting that got put on there, mm -hmm. and a phosphorus reduction, and then actually book that you know, as a benefit towards mm -hmm. achievement of the TMDL. Mm -hmm. And we report that on an annual basis. Sure. So working through the basin planners for the relevant basin for which you know, you're working on a particular project, we can actually do that internally with the tool. But the sort of the, the external tool doesn't have that functionality going right. into it. Great. Question. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up uh, this demonstration of the TP loading window unless there's any more questions or... Okay. Um, and, and I think this... I'll, I'll go ahead and do a quick demonstration of, of a different application of the scenario mode. So, so this was the RA scenario. Um, and let me, let me zoom out here and, and click to the NHD plus catchment. So it might take a a bit to load, but um, so the RA scenario again is kind of from north to south, applying DMPs everywhere and in, in almost every catchment for every 
land use category. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, holy shit. Here we go. Um, okay. So these these again are, are the right now looking at the total phosphorus yield reduction. So red means it's having a relatively high phosphorus yield reduction. Green relatively low. If I switch the scenario, um, I, I have a scenario called Keurig Green Mountain that represents a few projects that Keurig uh, funded and, and partnered with the Nature Conservancy to implement just in, in, in the past year in 2016. Um, let me close this. And, and so you can see that there's a few areas on the map where it's plotting an estimated phosphorus yield uh, reduction or, or prevention in reaching the, the lake or coming off the land for the projects that were implemented. And I'm, I'm just going to zoom into this one here, which I believe is in the Mallets Creek or Mallets uh, Bay area. Um, so you see the particular NHD plus catchment where it was implemented. Uh, if I click on that and go ahead and click on cropland, um, Rose, I think this will give you an idea. So, so this particular um, project involved preservation of native grass, wetland and grassland from being converted to cropland in the Mallets Bay area. So what I did to implement this particular project was um, it, it's somewhat of the opposite. Assuming cropland was converted to native grassland or to wetland, what would the phosphorus yield reductions be? And, and I entered the exact acreage and it, it amounted to be, uh, there, there's not much cropland in this catchment. So it's, if you add those two together, it's roughly 50% of the cropland or was prevented from being con converted to cropland, I guess, the, the wetlands in, in grassland. And, it, and it, you know, that, that would give you, I guess, about a 76% reduction um, in, in phosphorus if it were the other way around. So, so there are, you know, the options to, to handle those land use conversion type management practices as well. Um, and, and, the, and then, you know, also you can just get a feel spatially uh, where you know, where, where projects are, are being implemented on, on a more localized scale, again, because it kind of puts things into perspective. The, another project was up in the St. Albans Bay area. I know that TNC, the state, and BNRC are working to reclassify wetlands class two to class one. Are we measuring what the change and that conversion will mean in terms of phosphorus input? I mean, it, it, it may not be significant, but if you, of course, are targeting essential areas, it could be pretty significant. I, I think, Cree, that what happens there is you've got a, an, an intact, high-functioning wetland, and you conserve it, and it gives you that high you know, water quality conservation value, but you're not really changing the phosphorus load right. off it because um, reclassifying it only locks in its high quality. Right. They monetize possible future development. Well, yeah, not, that's another way to put it. Yeah. It's not that's a conversion. It's not a conversion. Exactly. It's not a yes. Okay. Right. But but you're right. I mean, there was there were, there were three really big wetland complexes just reclassified to class one, which is a huge. A plot. Um, On its way. <laughs> no, I, I mentioned because I think that could that it's very significant to be able to you know communicate to the public what that means. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Great. So that, yeah, that wraps up uh, what I was going to cover. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Neil, who will go into another more specific example of, of using the clean water road. Great. If I could sit where you're sitting, so I could just get a little bit better view. Welcome to look at that. So I have had the pleasure of playing with this tool from its first beta. And there's this area in the landscape, uh, in the watershed up near Lake Carmi uh, in Franklin, Vermont that I've been particularly interested in. And I know we have folks from the Lake Carmel Watershed in the room, which is fantastic, so they get to see this. Um, what I'm going to show you is a bit of an apple in my eye and something that we're working quietly, diligently, and internally on in order to make some substantial progress. But I'm going to show you a little bit about how we can integrate the blueprint, conservation blueprint, with the, water, the clean water roadmap and phosphorus reduction opportunities at the project level to get a real bang for the buck. And so let me just go ahead and uh, change to, I'm going to be showing the baseline, and I want to go back to the reasonable assurance scenario. I'm also going to make these, um, these little catchments, these small watershed areas, a little bit more opaque. So Lake Carmi in Franklin, 
is uh, it's a 1,400 two acre lake that is itself impaired for phosphorus. There's too much phosphorus in the lake, resulting in blue green algae blooms in the lake, somewhat systemically during parts of the year, particularly acute in this section of the lake right here, the northeastmost section of the lake. Um, in a prior professional life, I actually wrote the TMDL for the Lake Carmi watershed, for better or for worse. I know people, some folks aren't as satisfied with that analysis as they could be. Maybe it needs updating, but it is a good modeling analysis. Um, and so what I want to show you here is a little bit about the Lake Carmi area itself first. So let's just go to the base map that shows what this landscape looks like. And as you can see, it's fairly agricultural landscape. Let me get a little closer here. Um, a very large, very important bog complex at the southern end of Lake Carmi called the, Carmi, the Franklin Bog is a feature of this landscape. Lots of agriculture along this area here. Uh, some agriculture along this area. Fairly dense development along the shoreline of camps and so forth. Lots of agriculture along the watershed. So this is one where some of the, the lift is associated with agriculture. So just, just a little bit of an aside, but is it possible to put in the conserved land layer on this map? It could be, yeah. I was going to, at the very end, I was going to bring up sort of next steps. And right around Lake Carmine, which is all yeah. that. Sure, how come the water box is so bad? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another question. So in any case, let's start with phosphorus. So. I've just now lit up, I'll take it back off and I'll turn it back on. I like how quickly it functions when you're at a pretty close scale, right? It's, it's great. Um, so these are all the catchments surrounding Lake Carmi. And if, uh, I'm just going to turn that back off and turn on the streams layer for a moment. And so folks, if you can see this blue line that brings you up into the watershed, into this small pond. So this small pond is called Little Pond in Franklin. It's a very pretty little place, very hidden away, tucked away. Very few people have ever been there. Um, our staff have. And this is called the Marsh Brook, which discharges into Lake Carmi, right by the state park. So I'm going to turn the catchments back on now, and we're just going to ask a question about what is the status of the Marsh Brook catchment. So now I've brought up the dashboard, and its total phosphorus load is 476 kilos a year. It's got a yield of 0.86 kilos per hectare per year. That puts it in the 85th percentile. It's a pretty high yielding phosphorus catchment for the Missiscoy Bay. The Missiscoy Bay is a pretty high yielding basin for Lake Champlain. So this is an important one. And then so we can see here what the breakdown is of land uses. Um, so pasture and hay and then cropland are the two heavy hitters. And so I'll just leave this up as it is. Um, Again, the total catchment load. So if we go to the crops, now we can take a look at the BMPs that are identified in the reasonable assurance scenario, and, and we can look at what they are, and we could go down piece by piece by piece. But in essence, if the reasonable assurance scenario is imposed upon this landscape exactly as envisioned, uh, you could achieve a 63% reduction in total phosphorus, including some substantial reductions in total phosphorus out of the agricultural sector which in essence is what's um, specified in the Lake Champlain TMDL. So that's good, okay? There's more to it that I want to show you. Now if I turn this catchment off and instead I bring up the um, conservation blueprint layer here instead. And so there's some big red dots here. So these big red dots represent areas of high conservation value prospectively. And I'm not sure whether Franklin Bog is actually a protected area or not. No, oh, could I just correct an impression here? The bog at the southern end of Lake Carmi goes by a different name, Lake uh, Carmi Bog. Franklin, bog, Franklin bog. bog, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy, and it's a national natural landmark, <laughs> is to the north. Oh, okay, sorry. In the town of Franklin. Oh, okay. Both very important right. natural features. Well, I want to draw people's attention to this little, this very bright, bright red dot in the vicinity of Little Pond in Franklin. And this is how our planners use this tool. This is sort of the kind of thinking, this, this is how why we're excited about uh, the Clean Water Roadmap and its opportunities. So let's take a look at what's going on in this watershed, all right? So you've got this small pond surrounded 
by you know a fairly extensive wetland margin in what appears to be a fairly naturalized landscape. Water flows out of this, and if we get really close, you can see a bit of an impoundment structure here, at which point the stream exits the natural system and comes into a ditched area here. We'll turn off the stream layer because it's not exactly accurate once you get right down into it, okay? So here comes the stream down through this channelized area. Well, that makes sense because the, the producer here is needing to maintain access to the fields and so forth. Now, we'll also note that it takes a dog leg to the left and comes back up here. Now the stream, now that we're going downstream here, where'd it go? The stream has disappeared. The stream re-emerges down here. Stream? Stream? No stream. And so <laughs> what's going on here is in order to provide access, and this happened years and years and years ago, th this family basically piped the stream in order to provide more ready access to this production area, which is an important production area for their operation. Now you can see what happens during any kind of high water is the stream is bypassing its pipe and it's going out into the field and during particularly high water um, could easily carry sediment and nutrients back towards the downstream end and into the subsequent marsh brook and on down towards Lake Carmine. So the apple in our eye here is to work with this producer on a combined package of conservation up in this area and restoration in this area. By taking this stream and turning it into a stream that has access to an active floodplain through a combination of, of uh, restoration funding for the stream, conservation reserve enhancement program funding to pull that land out of, of conservation, and prospectively conservation of this, we can achieve not only, you know, sort of what the RA scenario says, but we can do some restoration to the equilibrium condition of that stream. So it's little tiny places like this that I hope to um, get one of those TNC red dots on, combined with a, a, a DEC red dot on the map that shows that, you know, we did a project here and this is the nutrient value that it had. So I just wanted to use this area of the landscape as an, as an opportunity to show the intersection of the roadmap and the blueprint. Really neat opportunities. And these opportunities are elsewhere as well. There's a question. Yeah, when you, sorry, I can't actually read anything. Um, okay. When you put that first layer on that was red, I don't yep. know. The catchment, so this is the phosphorus yield. Okay. Red means lots of phosphorus coming out. Okay, even at, even in this scenario mode, that's what red. I just was confused a little bit when you go into scenario mode, mm -hmm. whether that was good or bad. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So no, I kept it, um, I, I can't, I'm not sure why we're not refreshing right now, but um, what I did is I kept the so MHD plus so baseline. The map type at baseline. Right, oh, exactly, okay. exactly. And again, I'm not sure why we're not popping back up here, but. Um, it's higher between our 12 and MHD plus. Okay. And again, you can, you can throw parcel data in here. Say that again. You're going to put parcel data in here? No, we, we just have the layers available there. Parcel data, at a certain point, ran into you know privacy concerns and issues about identifying individual landowners. So we don't have parcel data. We've got town um, boundaries. We have the hydrologic boundaries uh -huh. that are relevant. Um, we work at the parcel level all the time. But Understood. Um, you know, and, and, and as you understand, as, as a practitioner that works at the parcel level, that there's some things that you would want to have, public, transparent, and other things. But this, this, this works. I mean, I can look at my maps and this Oh, yeah. Can yep. out, okay, that's the parcel I'm concerned about. And, and, you know, there are folks on the phone who are with NRCS who, you know, do have access to the CLU data and, you know, so. Yeah, another yes. online question okay. that has to do with, um, just the color differences. Why was the wetland such a high phosphorus load and the stream was green? That's a good question. And so I didn't identify, I didn't highlight. Okay, so the question was why when I turned on the conservation value, was the stream green and the wetland red? 
So this doesn't mean that in, in this view of things, when we're looking at the blueprint, we're not looking at phosphorus runoff from the stream. We're looking at what areas of the stream, if conserved, would have the highest value for water retention, for slowing water down, and for restoring ecological functionality. Do I have that right? Um, it, in, this, in this case, we're looking at the conservation value um, layer. And uh, in this case, um, it's actually the basically the red area is driven by uh, state significant uh, natural community occurrences, okay. in, in particular um, a poor fan and uh, uh, black spruce woodland bog. And uh, there's also the wetland associated. There's a lot of overlapping features right. um, that create those high values. And then further down we have um, the green is, is um, just not as high in terms of conservation value. Um, it, I don't know what's there, but it could have wetlands or um, just uh, floodable soils and things like that. Right. Right. Is that of a phosphorus load then, those red areas? Is no, they are not. They're representative of, of conservation targets. If it's redder, it's probably more, you get more conservation bang for the buck in those areas that are painted red. Whereas the HUC-12 images we're showing. Those more. are phosphorus. Exactly. That green is still a priority, it's just less of a priority. Exactly. In terms of conservation value, it's not as important. Right. right. Can we go back to the Hold floor? on. Let, let's just wrap up on the, the green versus red. Are you good? Yep. Okay, Ann. The ANR Atlas has a parcel layer, and that's public. Why would it not be able to be put here? We haven't explored that. So when I hear parcel data, I'm thinking about like the, the CLU data maintained by NRCS and the Agency of Agriculture. I don't know what CLU means. That's like the agricultural parcel data, like field by field by field. This is this is town tax This is town happens. tax parcel. Oh, okay. It gets you to who owns. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. I think they're working. I mean, it's incomplete right now, but the idea is that eventually you're going to have a statewide layer of all the parcels. Okay. But all right. Have the type of parcel that Sorry, different. And, and it's not the data that's available to the public on the Alice. You can't look and see who the owner is in general. Mm -hmm. You know the lines. So if you're looking at a map, you can say, "Wow, I've got one landowner here instead of." Okay. Ten. Okay. You know, so I think that's that's the kind of where it'd be really useful to have that information. Yeah, and you can then very quickly find out who owns it if you're deciding to pursue it. So it, it would be for us who work on a site and parcel level. Sure. No. So one of the things I wanted to do as as we close up the public training session here is to sort of ask a little bit about what are some valuable opportunities for next steps. And so I'm hearing one of them here. I know that this tool was built with the functionality to allow us to layer on additional um, GIS layers that are kind of canned and ready to go. Doesn't mean we'll intersect analysis at that parcel scale, but we can put geographic data on. I mean, just if you could like use this tool and go to VCGI and dump in, you know, what their layers are. Which are, I mean, there's a lot of functionality there that might be useful to us. Because we're looking at, you know, we're not just looking at this. We're looking at prime and statewide soils and understood. You know, and I mean, it, you know, yeah, it isn't necessarily going to be part of the atlas, but I could see yeah. how having it all combined and, and being able to sort of turn layers on and off, it would be a, it'd be really functional. One so, of the um, one of the things that I like to say when I'm talking about any of the new tools that we've been building up under the Vermont Clean Water Act, including this one, is that we're six months or eight months now into a 20-year lift. Of, of doing the full implementation of Act 64. And so, you know, we're building infrastructure just as fast as we can um, right now, largely to, to show in the legislative process that we've got all the tools we need to move forward because we need to. But we've got also plenty of time to improve what we have. So, you know, our intent is to develop a contract with these folks to allow for us to, you know, fix anything that might break or might be broken, but also to, to think about extended functionality. Why wouldn't you put a key to that color down in the right lower I, right? I think that the key to that color is right here. And so it's basically the, the, the conservation value is scored on a value of 0 to 100 split into 10 equal intervals. Correct. And so that essentially is the key. I believe that um, I think if you go to the in, whoops, if you went to the information tab here, in, there it is. Then you have access to 
the Nature Conservancy's website where you can get Dan's write-up of how this was all assembled and what that key means. I mean, the confusion is the it seems to be the inverse of everything else in terms of coloring importance. I think if you think about it, red as being an area of importance and not necessarily good or bad, then they can be right. viewed in the same way. Right. Well, that's why I'm asking why not use that white area to bring up the key readily identifiable. Okay. Well, that's, I guess, not something we had thought of a priori, so. With the map. I can see how it could be confusing, though. And so one point that also has come up with this is you need to keep in mind the relative, the fact that things are relative, they're scored on a relative basis. So if you're in an area where you have very high, for instance, phosphorus loading, you can rank those from good to bad, but the good is still high, and the bad is just very high. If you're in an area where loading is very low, and you rank them from, you're going to see a high area, but the high is low. And low is very low. Does that make sense? <laughs> so you always need to keep in mind the scale at which you're looking at the data, because otherwise you're going to interpret things incorrectly. Okay? Yeah. So again, I can say that again, but it's all relative based on the spatial scale that you've identified. So if you're in an area, for instance, where, um, to take this example, um, area of very high conservation value, um, that doesn't mean that the low values are not worthwhile. It means they're actually quite high, just that everything is high. In an area where things generally are on the lower end of the scale, just because something ranks high doesn't mean it's high in a state scale. It means it's high relative to the area you're looking at. So it may be poor either low. Um, and so again, looking at keeping in mind where you you got to do some work when you're using this. You got to think about what you're looking at, how to interpret it, and then again checking the legend, making sure you understand what the scales are. So is there anything that shows that relative value? Like I know on the phosphorus layer, you can see the percentage for that basin, and then for the like the larger basins, um, for conservation, for that conservation layer, or I don't know what it's called, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. yeah, in in the conservation value layer, they're actually, um, they're, they're the actual, we'd have to get into the details of how it's created, but the, the actu they're actually scores that are um, the, the weighted combination of the weights that we give to the individual layers, the, the 13 components, um, and those are rescaled to 0 to 100. So those are not necessarily related. They are relative to other, um, they're not rescaled in terms of quantiles or something like that in, in the way that the phosphorus data was. Kind of like a relative, like statewide, you're looking at all the range there, and these ones with high values are going to be high no matter where you are at what scale you're working. That's true. That's true. For the TNC layers. Yeah, for the TNC layers. The, for the, con the combined, the the combined scores are done a little bit differently. Uh, they're actually they're actually a com combination of, of the percent of uh, deciles or um, uh, that from the conservation water quality blueprint. Uh, sorry, the water quality impact layers. So we're trying to, we did it a little differently. So, um, but anyway, not enough time to go into that probably right now. But th those those values are related to um, the other value for the combined the combined layer. Those values are related, are relative to other scores in the basin. Sorry to make things more confusing. No, that's, that's okay. I mean, there's a, there's a tremendous amount to unpacking here, and I think that. You know, the thing to do is to begin to get in there and use it and become comfortable with the functionality. An interesting thing that I noticed is, having played with this a lot, Derek's bringing up pieces of functionality that I haven't been in that are really useful and I didn't you know, realize were so readily available in there. So I think different folks are going to use this tool for different purposes in different ways. I know my planners have been using it, but also in different ways. So. Um, Sir, just a very quick question. This is sort of in the Olympiad of acronyms. Perhaps. Oh, yeah. Um, for that. The uh, your tutorial 101 was mentioned earlier. But does it have a detailed definition of terms? And do you do you provide that, or is I mean I haven't gone. If I play with this, will I then be the chief of? <laughs> well, you certainly could be, and you're more than welcome to. Um, you know, get in touch with either of the contact folks, Tim Clear behind you, myself, if there's specific questions. I do think, you know, 
our focus has been on getting the tool stood up and getting it ready. Um, and I do think there's an opportunity for understanding, you know, what some of those BMP codes mean, for example. Those are arcane um, in terms of if you're not a SWAT pilot like Philip is or, or, or these guys are. Um, you know, you're not sure what CHCL particularly stands for. So there's some definitely some room for that kind of work. So, so on the documents page we referenced earlier, I mean, in any kind of technical report, typically there's a, a table or a list of that. Mm -hmm. So we could probably put something like that together yeah, over sure. time. So you could download it and have the acronyms and the, uh, the full meaning. Yeah, we, we didn't go through each one of them, but our intent was to add as many of those in information icons as we could and spell things out there. and then. Probably could and should be more, but it's got to start there. So. I, you know, I, I'm relatively new, as Ann knows, to this. And so I'm looking at it from sort of a public awareness standpoint. If someone were just really trying to get a handle on their community's profile and picture, sure. how could they do that and come out of it more knowledgeable and less frustrated? And that's, yeah. that's you yeah. know, so Good I... Point. Yeah. My one major recommendation out of this would be to develop a presentation that is geared to conservation commissions, planning commissions, um, as to how they can use it. Because they're often thinking local land trusts, not necessarily big guys that are, that are sitting here, as to how they can look at the area, their area of concern um, and perhaps inform their, their plans and, and their actions. Um, that's the most, and, and as a, you know, I see this for us as maybe a general education tool that, that we can use. Um, I don't honestly see it as something that's going to help us, um, you know, really inform the projects that, that we're going to, to undertake. Um, but I think if you can, we work a lot with local partners, so I think to the extent that you can help them use this, uh, that's the mm -hmm. biggest thing I, I see. That's a great recommendation, um, and to that point, we'll be having a follow-up training session this afternoon with regional planning commissions so that they can begin to take this out to their, um, their constituencies as well at the municipal level. But I take your point. I've been catching, the reason I stole my laptop from this gentleman is I've been catching some notes that I heard to try and get these recommendations. And I'm also taking oh, all the questions in, then, too. Uh, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming there's some folks from the Ag Agency on the phone. There are. It seems like this could be a real useful tool. you got a limited amount of money for BMPs that the state or NRCS has. And it seems like if you're going to be spending money on BMPs, then why not prioritize the areas where you're going to get the most bang for your buck? It seems like that using this tool with parcel-specific information, it, it could really help. I mean, or when someone comes in and wants to apply, you've got to make some decisions about where the money's going to go. And, and I think right. they are. Um, that's, a, that's a great point and allows me to kind of grab the talking stick. Um, we're only about five minutes left of our regular time, but we have this room all day. So if people want to stay and, and, and chat, that's great. But we grab the talking stick and talk a little bit about how the state DEC is, is actually using this behind the scenes. So the Clean Water Roadmap that you see here is not the tactical basin plan. But as we publish tactical basin plans, those are our game plan and our roadmap for incrementally implementing the Lake Champlain TMDL or the Lake Memphremagog TMDL, or the Long Island Sound Nitrogen TMDL, over you know the next 20-year period. And so we've used the data in the Clean Water Roadmap for that exact prioritization that you talked about. And I'm going to uh, bring up, uh, let me see, where is watershed management? our website and just give you a very quick flavor of how we actually are using this. And I'm going to bring up the Lamoille Basin Plan, which was signed by Secretary Markowitz, one of the last actions she took in 2016. There she is. Um, 
before she retired and went to the University of Vermont. Each tactical basin plan in the Lake Champlain Basin has a chapter pertaining to implementing the Lake Champlain TMDL. And I'm bringing that up on the screen now, and I just want to show you the intersection between the Clean Water Roadmap tools and the Lake Champlain TMDL. So we don't need to go through all of this, but I just want to get down to the section where we begin to talk about the Clean Water Roadmap. So these are the watershed scales we've been talking about. Big Basin, Huck 12, catchments. Within that, we actually are able to map out not only the total TMDL reduction potential, but also land use sector by land use sector. And when I say that, I mean through each regulatory program, what we believe can be achieved by implementing the Lake Champlain TMDL and where we should do it. And so a map like this identifies the locations in the Lamoille watershed where we might focus on forests in order to achieve forest reductions. Likewise, a map like this would show where we would focus on agriculture. And we use these to be able to get some fairly detailed estimates of what we believe is the total load and the total reduction potential associated with implementing our BMPs. So the Clean Water Roadmap is intended, the public version of it is intended to show to the public what all we're doing here with these plans that actually set the recipes for achieving the phosphorus reductions. So that's why we're kind of excited about this. Anyway, but that's not about the basin plans, it's about the blue water road map. I would argue against what this gentleman said in terms of color priority. You know, red is bad, it's phosphorus, we got to address that problem either on yield or total. But when you have the blueprint and it comes up red, it indicates it's a phosphorus loading. I mean, unless you're really experienced in inverting, going back and changing your mind and addressing it as that's the area you get the biggest bang in terms of conservation. So I guess, you know, changing color is not that difficult in computer. Yep. So I think there should be consistency for maybe not for the user. I hope you're going to address this to the, the general audience so they can use it and, and get down to the local planning level so it can be implemented. And that's the inverse. I mean, color has got to be consistency. And you emphasize that originally. Okay. So, so I'm arguing for that. Uh, that's a, that's a, a fair uh, let's see, and so do we have a, we don't have a color, yeah, we do, yeah, okay, so we, uh, let me turn off the catchments here. Does the blueprint have a change, a color change functionality, or that's just the catchments? Right? No, it's fixed at this point. Yeah. yeah. We'd be here. I think it's a great suggestion. Yeah. Now, now that we hear how, how it's um, being perceived by people, sure. we'll be glad to work on that. Thank you. Got it, got it. Noted. And I don't mean duly noted. But. <laughs> so, um, yes? Well, I think your plan, especially for Lake Carmine, sounds great, but when will it be implemented? Because we love your TMDL plan. We're still waiting for that to take effect. The load goes up every year for what we're getting. So. Well, we are, that particular project is, is, is in the works. It is. And uh, it's being, yeah, the, the, the folks who are the appropriate folks, Agency of Ag, Ben Gables is on there, Karen Bates from my staff has been working on that. And so, might chat with Ben specifically to know the status. But, um, you know, I revealed a little bit about a project that's kind of in process right now, and we don't want to. Um, compromise the ability of that project to move forward. So. so when we could actually see something happening on the land, would you say it's this year, next year, within five years, 10 years, um, 15 years still waiting? <laughs> I feel like, uh, I've already waited 15. I feel like his honor, Judge Gorsuch, on the stand for the yeah. last couple of days. Respectfully, Senator, I've gone just as far as I feel comfortable going within the candidate. No. 
Um, <laughs> if anybody listened to that, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, I just, I, I don't want to say, I want to allow those folks to work with the landowner and with, you know, prospective funders in a manner that makes it work, so. You know, that's what we've heard for 15 years, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, let's let's go to Kriti uh, first. I just, I just wanted to, to add on to what Ann was saying, uh, you know, having a tool that can be communicated to planners and so on. Also, C Grant, Becky, uh, Thor, you know, has done a wonderful uh, job training realtors, and I, I think that mm -hmm. I would add add them on as uh, an interested party uh, with a different skill set and explaining to the public, you know, about floodways and floodplains and wetlands. And that's Great, that's a good idea. Uh, go ahead, this this gentleman, and then you yeah. got it online. Okay, I would. I in terms of that project on the lake up there, how do you evaluate whether you should put a reroute the brook or say put a weir on the impoundment, a typical engineering solution to the runoff going down there so it wouldn't flood the field? Um, Is it cost? Is it going back to nature is best? How, how do you evaluate the solution. It's, it's what you just said. So the policy of the state of Vermont under Acts 110 and 138 of 2011 and 12 is to support streams managed in their equilibrium condition, which means streams that are able to develop a, you know, a meander through a river corridor, which gives them their least erosive form. The way the particular stream is routed right now does not achieve the goals. Now, that th there's nothing in the law that makes us compel a landowner to fix something like that, but the opportunities for nutrient reduction are tremendous by restoring the equilibrium of condition of that stream. We would achieve credit under the TMDL under the, the channel erosion stream in stream erosion component. We would achieve benefit under the BMPs associated with protecting that stream and putting buffer back in there. Um, we would achieve conservation value. So those are the intersects that I think about it. I don't think an engineering, an additional engineering fix would be the kind of thing the state would necessarily invest in. I guess I would argue with that. I'll do it separately. Because meandering stream has a lot of erosion over various flows. And so I'm not sure it's the best anti-erosion measure. Yeah, I would, I would love to pick that topic up sort of maybe outside of this venue well, because there's a, lot, there's a lot of science there right. that underpins the state's policy on um, equilibrium. A question online. Yeah, Ben is asking if these layers will be available standalone for ArcGIS as the water quality blueprint. Oh. Um, yeah, they kind of already are through our database, right? Yeah, I think they need to be published to the Atlas, for example, where other players are yeah, downloaded. That's, that's, that's a close question. Right? Well, so there would be a, um, a two-step process. So catchments are publicly available. You download them from Horizon Systems, which is the contractor that's putting these together. So you have a catchment layer um, that would need some work in order to process that for Vermont. But then beyond that, there's an ID for each catchment, and that's what is linked to the data in the CWR. So you'd have to do a little bit of work in GIS to join the catchment tables to the catchment layer. But then once you do that, you could um, have it as a spot. Now you and you you're doing that basin by basin, I think, right? As as no, we, we have that for the whole, we have that for the whole basin. Okay. Um, it's just a few RPCs have requested that and I sent that on the table. Okay. And they can just join it up. Sure. To their sure. So file. is that Ben Gabos yeah, from ben Copen? Gables, yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Hopefully Ben. Isn't yelling at me on the computer for over speaking about this project. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if you don't mind sharing that work with him, that would be great. Dan and Rose, I don't know if on, on your site are the blueprints, the water layers downloadable or mm. not at this point? And I don't have a, we don't have a place where that you can download them from. You could request them from us for sure. Um, yeah, at this point. Um, so I guess at this point, if there aren't any more questions, maybe I might 
offer, Tina, if you have anything you want to say on behalf of Keurig Green Mountain, I mean, your, your investment in this tool is just fantastic and we're so thankful for it. Um, I don't have a lot to add. I think the tool speaks for itself and the comments in the room point to, you know, even sort of greater places it can go. Um, but I think, you know, we came to it trying to be um, aware and inclusive of what the needs were. Um, we have our own water goal, but we realized that there was more than our water goal that was important um, on the landscape here and um, saw the opportunity to bring together Nature Conservancy we were already working with, Limnotech we were already working with, the needs of the state, and I think this is a really nice outcome and kind of manifestation of um, doing more with, you know, by bringing people together. So I hope it's really useful, and I hope it kind of lives on um, to help meet the TMDL or at least um, improve a lot on yeah. the landscape. Well, it, it'll definitely live on. Just a, a couple things I had identified as closing up remarks is some, some future steps that are in the, in the mind of our program. We are standing up a, a TMDL for phosphorus for Lake Memphremagog, so a big chunk of land to the north uh, and east of Lake Champlain. Uh, this is Lake Memphremagog right here that you can see, and this is the watershed of Lake Memphremagog, this entire land area here. Uh, we have an operational phosphorus model. It is not SWAT. It is not quite the same thing. However, what I'm hopeful is over the next year that we can take that modeling work and attach it to the Clean Water Roadmap as another geographic uh, piece of information. Not sure what that's going to take, but you know, um, we'll, we'll work internally. I saw the eat there and Phillips <laughs> response. We'll work internally to, to endeavor to make that so. I mean, ideally, there would be a nice one stop shop for Memphis Magog, for Lake Champlain, for nitrogen, for Long Island Sound. We don't really have a good modeling framework for that yet. Um, in addition, I mentioned that the state has this sort of tracking system. We have a project tracking system that we've stood up as well for all the projects that are prospectively available to be implemented to achieve the TMDL and for those that have been executed. And my hope and intent is to marry the two together so that you can begin to see dots on the map representing projects that were executed, um, which is also pretty exciting stuff. So. We're here. Feel free to get in touch if you, you know, have questions about this. Uh, I think Tim Clear would be the first point of contact. Can either go co go to me or go to Philip or go to others. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Great online attendance. I think we had uh, 40 non, you know, non people in this room, folks, hooked up on the webinar. We're going to have another session this afternoon for internal partners. A lot more people coming. I'm saying that for your benefit, Tina, so you know that this is getting airtime. Um, and if folks in the room, if there is a sign-in sheet, if you could just check off your name or if you don't see your name on the list, write it on there so we have a record of, of who attended in person. That'd be great. Thanks, everybody.